We are Irish Side of the Moon. Freedom of information. Personal empowerment. The Irish Side of the Moon. I still have a dream. There are many sources of energy available. Everything is energy. My God, do we need this a while. Free our mind. My corporations have taken over the world. Freedom of information. Personal empowerment. The Irish Side of the Moon. Hello. You're very welcome once again to the Irish side of the moon. This is Michael in the hot seat for interview number 76. Uh, the subject for this week's show is a gentleman by the name of Matthew Denteth. Matthew is a doctor of philosophy at the University of Auckland, currently writing a philosophical examination of conspiracy theories. Uh, Matthew's area of expertise is conspiracy theories, looking at uh, what constitutes a conspiracy theory, etc., etc. Um, if you go to his website, uh, his blog, whichever you wish to call it, allembracingapistol.org, uh, you'll be able to find out a lot more about what Matthew is talking about here. All embracing a pistol. There's a hyphen after all and a dot after embracing. And we'll have a link to that uh, on our own website, Irish Side of the Moon, when we archive this particular interview. Uh, Matthew Denthet, as I say, this week's guest, working uh, looking at uh, conspiracy theories. Uh, in his homeland, considered to be an expert, I think around the world, considered to be a bit of an expert. Uh, controversial figure, for all the right reasons, I believe. Uh, sometimes considered to be a debunker of conspiracy theories, which is not a title that Matthew himself is particularly comfortable with. Uh, but indeed, I think he takes all praise and all criticism with a uh, tongue firmly in cheek, which is a good, healthy attitude. Uh, very delighted to have Matthew on the show this week. Again, looking at uh, conspiracy theories in general, looking at why people respond to them, and uh, applying critical thinking as uh, with uh, James Randi, one of my, well, still my favourite uh, show we've ever done, show number six in our archives. Uh, critical thinking, a uh, wonderful tool uh, for everything in life, not just for the sort of subject matter that we uh, regularly feature on the show. Uh, Matthew, uh, if you check out his website, you'll find out uh, he covers a variety of uh, topics. I'll talk a little bit more about that after the interview. And uh, you also get to see some of his, uh, or hear, some of his radio appearances as well. They're archived on his own, uh, on his own website. Uh, okay, that's enough rabbiting on from me. Without any further ado, handing over to this week's guest. And I'm on the line with Matthew Denteth at this very moment. Matthew, how are you this evening? I'm good, thank you. My Michael, how are things in the Northern Hemisphere? Things in... Well, I can't speak for all of the Northern Hemisphere, although I thank oh, you Oh, surely for, you can. <laughs> ...for giving me that authority. But in my small section of it, it is a beautiful morning. It is bright and sunny and glorious out there. I'm not a morning person, but this would almost change my mind about that. And how is things in the Southern Hemisphere? Well, actually, uh, today has been a day of four seasons. So we've had, we've had the hot, we've had the cold... We've had the wet, we've had the dry. It actually reminds me of the time I was in Dublin, truth be told. I was going to say it sounds very familiar for those very reasons. Uh, we often have days of four seasons. Matthew, let us get talking here about uh, your particular um, area of expertise. I understand that you are New Zealand's top debunker and a conspiracy theory theorist. I know that that's true because I see it on your own blog and Twitter, so it must be true. Well, yes, I mean, the internet would never lie to us about these things. <laughs> never. First thing we always do when we, we bring guests on the show, we like to find out a little bit about their background. And your area of expertise is conspiracy theories. And uh, you're, we'll talk in greater detail about that as we, as we converse. But to begin with, let's talk a little bit about your background. What brought you into the area of conspiracy theories? Uh, what uh, influences on your early life uh, would have made you think, hmm, conspiracy theories. 
Well, I grew up in a small part of Auckland, the biggest city in New Zealand, called Devonport, which is located over on the North Shore. And Devonport was actually the first part of Auckland to be colonised by the Europeans when they arrived. And it was where the first military bases were set up. So Devonport's a coastal town. The Navy came in. They set up their first naval base there. Uh, Devonport has a long and illustrious history as part of the European colonization of New New Zealand. Uh, It was the site of the first hanging of a Pakeha male. So the first European to be hanged in New Zealand occurred in Devonport after a rather exciting and gory murder trial. And one of wow. the more, yes, yes, uh, actually the, the story of that is quite fascinating in its own respect. Essentially, uh, a naval officer ended up murdering his commander. He blamed the local Maori for the m- murder. Uh, the local authorities investigated, eventually worked out that actually this guy was actually to blame and not the local Maori whatsoever. They went to court and the judge uh, in his summing up, said British justice cannot be seen to discriminate on matters of race, and we've just hanged several Maori for a similar crime down south, so you shall be hung until death as well. Uh, so it was one of the few cases where Victorian justice actually appeared to be quite just, which I think makes it a really inter- interesting story in its own right. And I know uh, from, we, from, from previous conversations that, that history, and, and we, we'll go into that again later on, but yeah, that is another thing that interests you a great deal with regard to your own country. And uh, yes, obviously yes. what you're chatting about there is, is, is real, is real uh, hardcore uh, material for what ultimately interests you as well in that area. Yes, yes. And I mean, that's the, the history of, De- of Devonport ends up being so important for the kind of study I've made of these things that are often called conspiracy theories, because Devonport has a particular history about this place called North Head. Now, North Head is a military complex which is located on a large hill or head at the very end of Devonport. Uh, its Maori name is Monoika, and it was basically the location of a rather complex military base built there for the Boer War and then developed through the First World War and the Second World War. It's a a large complex, mostly made of tunnels, so there are lots of tunnels in it, there's buildings on top. And when I was growing up in Devonport in the the 80s, suddenly this conspiracy theory started to emerge about North Head. What happened was that this guy called John Earnshaw, who was a documentarian who lived in London, decided to leave London and immigrates to New Zealand. Uh, He arrived in New Zealand and he wanted to find something to make a decent documentary about. And he was talking to someone, I think on the ferry, actually traveling from Auckland over to Devonport for a day trip one day. And they mentioned, oh, have you heard about these uh, missing tunnels on North Head? And he said, no, what are these missing tunnels? And the person told him the story. In the 40s, 50s, 60s, and early 70s, when North Head was still a fully functioning military base, children used to sneak onto North Head to basically patrol around the place and explore. And those children who had then grown up by the 70s and 80s, uh, when North Head was made into a public reserve where the public could wander around and investigate the tunnels, were beginning to tell stories that actually some of the tunnels they had been in when they were children were no longer either readily accessible to them or appeared to be missing, presumed hidden. And people began to ask, why would the government and the military that controlled North Head have gone to such lengths to hide the existence of tunnels that everyone remembered going through as children? And this led to basically a variety of different stories uh, one of which is about missing seaplanes, one of which is about discarded ammunition, and the more extreme versions involve a large-scale military cover-up which may hide even the existence of UFOs deep within the North Head Tunnel complex. And John Earnshaw, as a documentarian, thought, oh, this actually sounds like a really good topic 
for my documentary. So he approached the New Zealand government and said, look, I want to make a documentary about the North Head Tunnel Complex. I believe there's a rather interesting story here about some missing seaplanes which uh, belonged which, uh, from the beginning of the century. I want to apply for a license to investigate North Head and as part of that license, I also want to be able to claim as treasure trove anything I find within North Head. And thus the conspiracy theories of the larger type actually start. Because John Earnshaw's primary goal in making a documentary about North Head is to discover the location of the very first seaplanes built by the Boeing and Vestavald, now Boeing Corporation, uh, who had the unlikely names of Mallard and Bluebell. So in the very beginning of the 20th century, when the Boeing and Vestavald Corporation were beginning their work to develop planes, they built two prototype seaplanes to basically test whether it was possible to make planes of a particular type, cloth-covered planes, that could land and take off from water. Once they built these first two prototypes, they were then ready to start mass production. And because the prototypes were basically cheaply engineered prototypes for the process of trying to work out whether their plans worked, they then sold these planes on. And they were bought by these two guys called the Walsh Brothers who owned the flying school in Auckland. They were shipped all the way down to New Zealand. And these planes were then used for mail runs, joyriding, and training pilots in New Zealand to fly. Now, as the First World War approached, the war office in Westminster decided that New Zealand needed to form its own air force. So essentially, they decided to privatize all of the air assets that existed within New Zealand. And so the government of the day and the military basically came in and they took all of the Walsh Brothers' airplanes and they made a catalog of the planes and they decided to shift all of the important uh, munitions and air craft over to Devonport, where the army had its base. And what happened was that these planes were crated up, they were, put, they were transported across the waves to, to Devonport, where they were then placed onto the parade ground at a place called Torpedo Yard, and they sort of sat there for several years in their crates, until such time that a sergeant major went, uh, these these planes are really getting in the way of parading my men up and down the square. Uh, could we do something about this? And they hummed and hawed about it, and eventually they said, oh, well, uh, we're not quite sure what we're doing about these things. By this particular point in time, uh, air technology had moved on, and what seemed like cutting-edge technology uh, was now looking a little bit old and dilapidated. But they also didn't want to get rid of the things which they had spent all this time creating up and moving from place to place. So the commander of Torpedo Yard said, look, what we'll do is we'll put these planes and aircraft parts into storage in the North Head complex. We'll seal the tunnel up so it'll be nice and airtight, and we can deal with these particular bits and pieces when we get time to it. And that's basically where all the documentary records for the existence of the planes ends. So we know that they were moved from Kohi Maramara, which is located in Mission Bay on the other side of the Waitamata. They were shipped by boat over to Devonport. They sat in a parade ground for several years, and then they're cratered, put into boxes in North Head, and they just completely disappear. And so what happened is that John Earnshaw was going, well, look, these planes were put into storage, and now we can't find them. Now, also, there are people who used to wander around North Head as children who claim that they used to wander around tunnels they can no longer access. Surely what's happened here is that the tunnels that children used to be able to access they can no longer find must be the tunnels where these planes have been put into storage. So what we'll do is we'll do fairly invasive investigation of North Head. We'll dig holes, we'll look in likely locations, and we will find these tunnels, we will find the aircraft, and behold, I'll have a superb, doc a superb documentary 
on my hands. And so that was the initial story. Now, at this stage, this isn't actually a conspiracy theory. This is just a story about tunnels which have, which have gone missing, which may or may not contain treasure trove within them. But as soon as John Earnshaw began looking for these tunnels, weird things began to happen. Uh, he got the Navy, who were in charge of North Head at the particular time, uh, to bring in engineers to investigate the tunnel structures. And they kept on having to stop work because they would find weird smells that smelt like decaying ammunition. Or there would be orders from higher up in the command chain that simply made the men cease work and the investigation stopped. Uh, people kept changing their stories about the existence of these missing tunnels. The top military brass denied explicitly there were any additional tunnels in North Head that weren't freely accessible at that particular point in time. And Earnshaw became quite convinced that there was something going on behind the scenes to hide the existence of the tunnels and to deprive him of his rightful claim to treasure trove. Now, this is happening in the very early to mid-80s, and I was growing up in Devonport at the time, and my father was born in Devonport, and he had lived there for most of his life, and he had wandered around North Head as a child with his friends. And so John Earnshaw was basically going through the list of all the people who lived in Devonport to try and get their opinion as to what they thought was going on in North Head. And my father must have been one of the few people who actually lived in Devonport who didn't think there were additional tunnels in the North Head Tunnel Complex. And this is a child fascinated me, because my father's best friend, Evan, who had wandered through the North Head Tunnel Complex with him as a child, was adamant that he and my father had been through tunnels that they could no, no longer access. Well, my father was saying, no, that was nonsense. There were no missing tunnels on North Head whatsoever. And as a child, that's the kind of thing that makes you go, what's going on there? Which, which story should I believe? Should I trust my father, who exactly. claims that there are there? That's the part that fascinates me as well, of, of the story. I mean, it's a very fascinating story anyway. But when you get to that part of it, the idea of people who share history and share experiences but have contradictory memories of that, that's fascinating to me as well. I find that fabulous. Oh, yes, and I mean, it's, it's actually quite fascinating looking at just how common this is a motif in so many different theories about weird phenomena or unlikely phenomena in the world. You will get contrasting explanatory accounts of something that has gone on where two people who were there at the same time tell radically different stories about what they saw or what they experienced. And the stories are so different, you end up going, well, one of them has to be right and the other one has to be wrong. But what do we do to try and sort between these particular bits of evidence and decide which is the best explanation of the phenomena? So, and, yeah, and, so and going up thing, in... I, I, another thing I like about it, the whole thing, it's like for you, it's like growing up in a famous five uh, adventure, if you remember the famous five books. Oh, uh, the five go to sm sm Smuggler's Top was always my favourite one. It was all the secret tunnels. Yes! But but it is, it's like growing up in that. And this was going on around you, as you say, in the 1980s, your formative years. And this then flip, flipped the switch, as it were, and made you, because it was on your doorstep, uh, take an interest in the idea of conspiracy theories and the idea of people wondering what was going on and what was the truth behind it all and behind all the stories. Yes, yes. So essentially, because there was this developing theory that posited a conspiracy by the military and or the government, uh, rival theories by locals in Devonport claiming that there were tunnels they had been through uh, versus other members of the local community said, no, no, I worked on North Head. It's exactly the way I remember it as a child. I mean, this was a major story in New Zealand at the time. There were questions being asked in Parliament about it. The Minister of Defence said that they would engage in an investigation. Our Department of Conservation, which is involved in all the major archaeological work 
actually ended up doing two archaeological investigations on North Head to look for the existence of the tunnels. Uh, and these particular investigations were led by the chief archaeologist called Dave Vert. And he actually started off as being a believer. He thought there were additional tunnels in North Head that they would locate through investigation. And by the end of the second investigation, was actually quite convinced that there was something faulty going on with the memories of the people who claimed there were additional tunnels in, in North Head. So it was this massive sto- story, and basically growing up in the middle of it, of, to a certain extent you could say, has tainted my worldview ever since. Because how do you deal with this kind of information when it's so large and so complex? Okay, well, we'll come back to that briefly, I'm sure, later on. But, yeah, that's what led you to uh, take the path. It tainted you, as you say. And uh, moving forward a little bit, coming right up to date, that was the beginning of the story. Let's move to the um, the current portion of uh, your Indeed. story. You came onto my radar uh, a few weeks back uh, through indirectly through a friend of mine. Uh, she lives in Christchurch, and uh, she was making posts on Facebook, and we, we chat on Facebook. Somebody I, I went to school with years ago, she's married and living out in your part of the world at the moment. And she was uh, commenting on a gentleman by the name of Ken Ring. And she was quite distressed and annoyed because Ken Ring had been saying some things, <coughs> and they were causing a little bit of, of, of worry and anxiety in her circle of friends. And that interested me, and we talked about it briefly, and then I read up on that gentleman, and that is ultimately what led me to uh, discover you and uh, the great work that you're doing. So let's ask, first of all, let me ask you, first of all, about Ken Ring. Who is Ken Ring, and what has he been saying? Well, Ken Ring is an astrologer uh, who has made quite a business from... Uh, this website he runs called Predict, predictweather.com and the selling of almanacs where he provides you for the next year's worth of weather and the beginning of January, which is all based upon the position and peregrine of the moon. So he's an astrologer, but his particular interest is in the phases of the moon. He's of the firm belief that all climate data can be predicted by basically looking at where the moon is in the sky, and that then tells you what the weather is going to be like at particular points in time. And prior to the end of last year, uh, he was known for his weather, his weather predictions, the selling of his almanacs and such like. But when we had the massive earthquake in Christchurch in September, Ken Ring came out and said, oh, by the way, not only did I predict this earthquake, but my system of prediction via the moon also predicts tectonic activity. And this led to an absolute furore at the time, because people started actually quite seriously looking at the kind of predictions he made. Because prior to that point in time, he was one of the many people involved in trying to make long-term predictions about the weather. But suddenly, he was making a claim that it was possible to use the system to predict earthquakes. Now, given how massive the earthquake in September was, People thought, oh, well, this is actually quite important. If there's something to what he's saying, then we should actually investigate it and see what we can do with it. And if there isn't something to what he's saying, then we should probably criticize him and ask him why do you think he can make these particular predictions. Uh, Now, Ken Ring made a variety of different claims at the time, some of which he's retracted, some of which he's edited away. Uh, and he was sort of largely forgotten about a few months after the September quake. But then we had the massive aftershock in February. And suddenly Ken Ring appears on the scene again, claiming that he has predicted that particular quake. And he then says there's going to be another massive quake sometime between the 19th to the 21st of March, and it's going to be a quake for the history books. And suddenly, the media and the skeptics jump on it, and they go, look, he claimed that he made a prediction for the February quake, and we can judge whether that prediction is good or bad, but he's made a quite definite prediction about an earthquake in March, and this is something we can actually test for. 
Uh, and so the media started looking at the particular kinds of claims he made. And they discovered that not only did Ken Ring essentially predict an earthquake every second day of the year, so he would talk about the likelihood of there being earthquakes at any particular point in time, uh, and, he, and he, he made some really interesting claims, such as he's able to predict earthquakes uh, within two weeks either side of a full moon. People were going, well, that's interesting, because the lunar... Uh, calendar, uh, the lunar month is about 28 days, so he's saying that he can predict an earthquake any side of the full moon, i.e. at any point in the year, without any particular specificity as to what's going on there. And the people started actually dealing with this quite seriously, and they discovered that he would make these very vague predictions, so he would say that the earthquake that was coming up would be between a magnitude 4 and a magnitude 6, and people would say, oh, but on the Richter scale, which is log logarithmic, that's not just like going from you will walk two feet to your bed or three feet to your bed. It's a bit like saying you'll walk one meter to work or you'll walk 300 miles uh, to, to work instead, given the logarithmic scale that these things are operating on. And people yes. basically said, look, he's... He's a, he's a charlatan. He probably does sincerely believe that he's figured out a mechanism for predicting the weather and predicting earthquakes. But what he's failing to realize is that he's treating accidental successes as being indicative of his system working, and he's ignoring uh, all the time he gets it wrong and not actually sort of confirming his own thesis and throwing away any throwing away any data which would disconfirm the instances. And so yes, uh, he ended up becoming, for the period of a few months, a quite major source of irritation for people who are living in Christchurch, who were actually quite scared that every single time he would make a prediction about an earthquake, uh, that you know, people, even if they didn't believe him, would be on edge thinking, well, maybe it is going to happen this time. If he's right, what's going to happen? And also the concern that the people who did believe what he said were acting upon it. So they would take their children out of school, they would pack up their homes, and they would drive north to try and avoid an earthquake. People going, this is a really, really disruptive thing. And yet he seems incapable of realizing that he doesn't actually have the theory. He simply has a media platform and a whole lot of supporters who don't want to hear anything said against him. And that was really what annoyed my friend because she found that having read uh, up on him, uh, from her perspective, his predictions didn't add up, uh, kind of for the reasons that you have quoted just perfectly. And yet... And this fascinates me, this is another thing that fascinates me. Many people, without having uh, bothered to check properly or verify, were believing, taking that leap of faith. And that seems to be something that's quite common in the area of conspiracy theories. And I'm doing air quotes here because it's a term we don't use very much, in fact, ever on the show or behind the scenes with the show. Because we don't like that term for various reasons that I'll go into later. But yes, the, the common thread of people who will take the leap of faith in the absence of hardcore facts, in the absence of critical thinking. And early on in the run of the show, we had James Randi on, and it still stands as one of my... As no, it still stands as my favourite show that we've ever done, simply because the ideas and principles of critical thinking, as he put across on the show and as he puts across in his work... Um, really appeals to me as something you can apply to everything else that we cover on the show and its absence in situations like the Kin Ring situation fascinates me, just fascinates me and as, as you just said there it, it, a whole media frenzy grew up around this man and what he said uh, possibly quite sincerely believing it what he said he could do mm. and I mean there's sort of, there's a sort of underlying current in New Zealand me media discourse, which unfortunately sort of aids and abets this particular kind of beha beha behavior here. Uh, we, sort of, we sort of have what's called the tall poppy syndrome in New, Ze New Zealand. We don't particularly like intellectuals or people who seem to know what they're talking 
talking about because it seemed to be a bit snooty, a little bit upper class. Uh, New Zealand likes to pride itself on being a largely classless society. Uh, this is mostly a lie. We actually are a heavily stratified society with a rich class and a poor class and a middle class. But the cultural myth is that we have no class-based system going on here whatsoever. And a result of that is that we therefore don't appreciate people who know what they're talking about. We like to let the little man or the little woman actually have their say. And if a scientist or a specialist dare contradict them, that's seen as being something that's just quite harsh and quite horrible to do because surely, the discourse goes, everyone is entitled to their opinion. And actually, this is what Ken Ring does. He occasionally will shy away from the notion he makes any kind of prediction whatsoever. And what he'll say is that, oh, no, I don't make predictions. I simply offer my opinions. And if you want to listen to my opinions and act upon those opinions, then you're entitled to it. But I'm not predicting things. I'm just giving an opinion in the same way that an opinion writer for the paper is giving an opinion. I'm not making any predictions whatsoever. So he's using that discourse to essentially escape any kind of legis le legitimate criticism. Okay, so we've talked about your background and what got you started on this particular road. And we've talked a little bit about how you came onto my radar. And as I say, Ken Ring is what led me to you. And when I was reading up on Ken Ring, I discovered... You have a blog, and you are a radio personality. You have a, and you've had a couple of slots. We'll talk about that in a moment, where you, where you uh, appear and discuss a variety of uh, conspiracy theories, for again, for want of a better term. So the connection between all of this is your PhD. Somewhere between your formative years and the present, you uh, decided that this would be a good subject for your PhD and you took a, st took a step to set that in motion. Uh, how did that come about and what has the response been to your uh, ideas in the world of academia? Well, initially what happened was that after I went through secondary school, I did what many people did in the 90s when unemployment was really, really quite high in Board. I avoided going into the workplace and went to university instead. And I took a BA, uh, which is often called the bugger all in New Zealand. And I initially started off doing classics and anthropology slash archaeology. Um, because the interest in North Head meant that I'd actually developed a quite keen interest in the generation and dissection of archaeological Data. And in my first year, I ended up taking two philosophy courses, one in ethics, one in metaphysics. And due to years and years of speech and drama training for my speech hesitancy, uh, which then led on to years and years of doing debating in secondary school, I found that I really liked doing the philosophy because it was all about having arguments with people and coming up with good reasons for having the beliefs that that you did. So over the period of the three years it took me to do my BA, the classics basically melted away, and I ended up doing a BA with a double major in philosophy and anthropology slash archaeology in the end. And I got to the end of that particular process, uh, and I ended up taking a MA in philosophy to continue my education. And then when I finished the MA, I okay, said, so what, what am I going to do next? Now, during this time, I got involved in the teaching of the undergraduate critical thinking course through the Department of Philosophy. And my friend and colleague and now supervisor, Dr. Jonathan McEwen Green, he and I were talking one day about how to teach a class on inferences to the best explanation and how we should contrast that with people who make inferences to any old explanation and thus not the best one. And we were having this discussion and we hit upon the notion, and I actually can't remember whether it was me who came up with it first or whether it was John, and we do a lot of very collaborative work, that often some people 
have beliefs in conspiracy theories, not because they're the best explanation of a phenomena, but because they're psychologically pleasing, the kind of explanation that makes you feel that a bad event happened because someone wanted it to, rather than that sometimes the world just happens to uh, have very bad outcomes. And well, yeah, I, mean, I, I get that because the idea that it is comforting to believe that there's a structure and it's comforting to believe uh, whether uh, the people uh, above us are, are looking after us beneficially or doing things. It's, there is something, isn't there, that you respond to, the idea that, you know, they did plan 9-11 or they did plan, uh, even though it's a bad thing, it's reassuring because it, it gives you the idea that there is no chaos. It gives you the idea that it's all part of some plan. And it allows yes, you to I... react as well. So if 9-11 was just the result of American foreign policy in the Middle East, the question of, well, what, what can I do about that? I mean, I don't have any ability to affect the people who work in the, de uh, the Department of State or what the executive branch of the American government does. But if it was actually an inside job, and it was George W. Bush and Dick Cheney and Donald Rumsfeld who actually engineered the event, I can... I, I can indict those pe people. I can run campaigns, have those people hounded from office and such like. So it's not just psychologically pleasing on one level to know that the world is the way it is because someone wants it to be that way. It gives you someone to actually point the finger at, which if it's a much more complex pro process, they might have a variety of coincidences, coincidences and cock-ups involved in it then it m makes it much harder to react to things. So, yes, I think there's a, a lot to be said for that particular psychological avenue for the discussion of these things that we, we sometimes call conspiracy theories. But going back to the uh, critical thinking talk, John and I were discussing the notion of using a conspiracy theory as an example of an inference to any old explanation. And I brought up the North Head example. Uh, John also grew up in Devonport, and so he knew all about the story. And I, at the time, rather jokingly said, why don't we make it a field trip to North Head? So let's do something really quite avant-garde. Let's discuss conspiracy theories in the critical thinking class, and we'll have an associated field trip where we'll take the students to North Head, we'll get a member of the Department of Conservation to come along and explain the history and the thesis of the North Head Tunnels complex to them, and we'll make a day of it. And John said, I don't think philosophy classes do field trips. I think we should try this. So we put it into the, into the syllabus. We advertised the day the field trip was go going to occur. We thought we'd be lucky and get around about a quarter of the class turn up. And then on the day, we got almost three quarters of the class turn up for the field trip. Uh, so we had about 120 students turn up on North Head to wander around the tunnel complex on a rather windswept Sunday afternoon. And suddenly we realized that actually that what we were doing actually had legs. And at that particular point in time, I was thinking about doing a PhD. And I thought, well, actually, there's not much philosophical investigation into these things called conspiracy theories. There, at that time, there had just been published a single volume of eight papers, which at that time was the complete literature on conspiracy theories in philosophy. And I thought, actually, there's work to be done here. There's a lot of things to be said for this particular kind of analysis. So I ran it past John, asked whether he'd be my supervisor. We ran it past the graduate committee in the department. And here I am, <laughs> four years later, doing a PhD on the topic, all due to the fact that I grew up in Devonport that inspired me to use that as an example in a critical thinking class. And then the analysis that we came up with in the critical thinking class has developed into a thesis of somewhere between 90 to 100,000 words. Okay, the pieces of the jinx, jigsaw that makes up Matthew are falling into place. Uh, going to take a short break here. We took a customary break at the halfway stage. Going to play a little message. Uh, we will be right back on the other side of the moon with Matthew Dinkin. Stay with us.
You're listening to the Irish Side of the Moon. You can hear our new episodes every Monday on radiomedia.org and irishsideofthemoon.blogspot.com. You can also download episodes from iTunes, Stitcher, and many other sites. You can follow us on Twitter, you can join our Facebook group, and if you're already in the group, don't forget to invite your friends. If you have any ideas for future guests on the show, send an email to shane at the Irish side of the moon dot IE. We are Irish Side of the Moon, freedom of information, personal empowerment. We're back uh, on the line with Matthew Dentet. We've talked a little bit, Matthew, about your uh, childhood growing up and the whole tunnel system in North Head in Devonport and how that piqued your curiosity with regard to conspiracy theories and we've jumped forward a little bit and you started you say what four years ago you started a mammoth project a phd with regard to the idea of conspiracy theories and i want to come back to that specifically in a little while and look at some of the stuff because i've been fortunate enough to read that first chapter and i've thoroughly enjoyed it but there's something else missing in the picture the blog and the radio uh, uh, appearances how did those come into the picture, and how and why did that become part of the story? Well, when I first started doing research for the PhD, I began to realize it's actually a really mammoth task to actually write 100,000 words on conspiracy theories. So what I ended up doing was looking at, well, what ways can I make this a more enjoyable experience? And I hit upon the notion that because I can be doing lots of serious writing on the topic, why not start a blog that would not only detail what I was investigating, but also be, allow me to pass commentary on things that weren't going to be appropriate academic topics for the PhD, but were things that I wanted to be able to express to people people show elements of things that I was reading and such like. So yes, essentially, I started doing the blog for the sheer fact that it was actually something to keep me sane through the long and lonely process of actually writing the PhD. I love that idea because having done some writing myself over the years, everything from academic writing to some very, very long shopping lists, I understand what a lonely and horrendously uh, soul-destroying experience it can be to sit in a darkened room all by yourself, chugging away and typing away furiously. And I love the idea of what you've done. And, and one of the, the things we like to do on the show when we bring on guests, and we've had guests from a variety of different disciplines, we like to find things that these people, people such as yourself, do that other people listening can also do, can also emulate. And that's one thing. There's a big bell going off over that. The idea that somebody listening should appreciate the idea of you taking something which is a solitary academic experience and transforming it basically very simply by creating a blog, you transformed it into something that became a communal thing because uh, suddenly you're getting feedback, suddenly you're getting responses, suddenly the project becomes something that isn't in isolation anymore. And I hope, and I presume, and I guess, it made the whole experience more palatable, more enjoyable, and a little less uh, lonely and soul-destroying for you. Yes, and I mean, I've actually not just made friends via the internet by, you know, writing posts, people commenting on it, going to other blogs, reading what they've got to say, and being engaged in that particular process. But I've also ended up meeting a large number of these people as well and getting involved in other projects that they're r- r- related to. So it actually is, it's not just been a useful outlet for the solitary, sometimes monotonous existence of the PhD. It's allowed me to engage in other people's work meet these people and come to a better understanding of the kind of topics that we sort of share research interests in. Uh, in regard to the ra- radio show, uh, in, the, in the first year of my PhD, the James Randi Educational uh, Fund decided that they would start a scholarship and they asked for submissions for people to basically, so they're going to award three scholarships in the first year. And so they sent out a call for people to write in and express why they wanted the scholarship, what kind of research they were doing and such like. And I thought, oh, this seems, this seems like good fun. And the James Randi Educational 
funds, you know, uh, they deal with such things as conspiracy theories and such like. So I'll give it a go. So I wrote up a proposal. I attached to it uh, a few bits and pieces that I'd already worked on from the PhD. I sent the form away, and then I waited. And I waited, and I didn't hear anything. And then eventually one day I was speaking to one of the referees that I had put down as someone that they could contact to find out more about the quality of work that I was doing uh, to verify I was an actual PhD student such like. And I said, oh, by the way, did, the, did James Renty or Co. ever get in contact with you? And they said, no, never heard anything. And by that particular point in time, I just assumed that I'd just been very unsuccessful in my application, like someone who applied for the Reader's to Hygiest Prize, you know, didn't get it this time. And then I woke up one morning, and there was an email from James Randy. And the email wished me a good day, and it said that I'd been awarded the first scholarship. And I read it, and then I read it again, and then I did that usual thing that characters in cartoons did. I pinched myself to try and to just verify I wasn't having a dream at that particular point in time. And lo and behold, I had received the first scholarship they had offered, which was very exciting. Mm. And because of that, one of the news, well, the, actually at the time, the news director, Jose Barbosa at BFM, which is a University of Auckland-based student radio station, got in contact with me saying, look, we see you've been awarded the first ever James Randi Educational Fund scholarship and we would like to interview you about what your research topic is, uh, and we'll put that onto our morning current, current affairs show. So I went on, I spoke for about 20 minutes about my research, my aims, my goal, what it was like receiving the first scholarship and such like. And Jose turned to me after the interview and said, look, would you be willing to do an occasional slot talking about conspiracy theories? We'd love to have you on. And I said, yeah, that would be really, really good, actually. Uh, I went away thinking, fame will be mine. Within weeks, I'll be a household name all over New Zealand. And then I waited for the call. And I waited, and I waited, and weeks went by, and then months went by, and I eventually decided that all people in the media are fickle, and he basically promised me the world on a stick and then, and then delivered nothing. Six I'm months cruel. later. I know, I know. The media are so cruel, Michael. They're so, we so are cruel. are bastards. Every last one of us is true. They say, you, you milk us until we're dry, and then you put us onto the, uh, the trash heap of history. Uh, but I'm sure I'm sure you won't do that whatsoever. Uh, anyway, I was I I was on Queen Street, the main uh, the main street in the CBD of Auckland one day with a friend of mine buying donuts as one is wont to do on a Friday afternoon, and we were in the shop eating donuts, and Jose walked by, and he sort of did a double take when he saw me, and I thought, aha recognizes me and he's feeling the guilt of never calling me back so i continued eating my donut and then he came back and said oh sorry i forgot your name there for a minute uh do you remember me i said yes you're jose we had to be talked on the radio he said look i'm so sorry i lost your phone number uh would you be willing to come into the studio next week and talk about doing a, the radio slot that i mentioned and i said yes and basically from that, a fortnightly segment of about 15 to 20 minutes if, uh, was developed where I would choose a particular topic, normally a classical conspiracy theory of some kind, and then the host and I would talk about that on a Sunday morning at about 11 o'clock. And that ran, I think, for just over two years in in the end. Uh, first of all, started off with a, uh, the host, his name was Simon Pound, who then went on to a career in TV. And then Jose actually took over the Sunday slot. And then he left BFM for a career in TV as well. Uh, my slot was axed a few weeks after that because the new host decided that they would actually focus the entire show on cryptozoology instead. Uh, I think it probably is the only 
Sunday breakfast show in the entire world on student radio devoted to cryptozoological investigations. Uh, and then the slot was resurrected about eight weeks ago. Uh, so I'm back on the radio once again. Yes, and, and fame and fortune will be yours as a consequence. I've heard some of those pieces because um, if people... Now, we'll be putting the link up, and, and we've, we've talked about your blog, but we haven't um, uh, referenced it yet. It's allembracingepisto.org. And it hyphen, is, yes, all hyphen embracing dot episto dot org. Perfect, and we'll put a link up. So from, from people going there, they can find links, and they can hear the newer slots, the ones that started, as you say, about eight weeks previous to this. And, and in those, um, you cover a variety of whatever is a hot topic or whatever is kind of, if there's obviously a, a slow news week, as it were, you dive into the into the archives of, of conspiracy theories. Tell me, um, with regard to what you put on the blog and what you put on, and what you say on the radio, what's feedback like? I mean, do people respond positively or negatively? Because when it comes to some aspects of conspiracy theories and some aspects of conspiracy theorists you don't pull any punches and where you see logic flaws in what's being said you do point them out with great aplomb and a great sense of humor i must say but you do point them out so i'm curious what's response i i must admit uh, the actual response to the radio segment has been muted to say the least i've had a few cases where after a segment has aired someone has rung up, not usually to criticise me, but to either ask that I cover a particular topic uh, or to advertise to me that I should watch particu- a, a particular film. So after one of the slots, someone rang up and said, have you seen Zeitgeist yet? I said, no, it's actually on my list of things to watch. And, oh, I'll send a copy of the DVD into the ra- radio station. I have to say that never actually occurred. Uh, the actual the, the, the phone call occurred. The okay. DVD turned up, unless of course one of the people at BFM took it home, which Ooh, you know, really don't trust the media possibility. <laughs> you know, student radio, they're students just like me. You know, they'll take a free DVD wherever they 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 can get one. I'm besmirching an, an anonymous someone just by saying it. Uh, but on the blog, there have been a few situations where I really have rankled particular parts of the community. Mm. Uh, most recently, the supporters of Ken Ring uh, have been up in arms by the <coughs> fact that I did criticize the methodology he uses for predicting earthquakes and the weather. Some of the comments have been uh, idle threats of harm towards my, per- my person. Uh, wow. At, when the radio show resumed about eight weeks ago, I had a very interesting correspondence with an anonymous commenter uh, who basically charged me of working with people like George Soros and the academic left, especially the sociologists for some reason, uh, for deliberately construing conspiracy theories as being a joke phenomena which can be easily debunked in a 10 minute segment so as to please my political masters and that they weren't hoping to persuade me to change my way just to guilt trip me by making me realize that people knew exactly what I was up to uh, which was interesting because I wasn't aware I was up to that at all Uh, but apparently yes I work with the American uber rich left to basically downplay claims of conspiracy. And if this is the case, I do wonder where the paychecks are actually going, because they've yet to actually receive any real benefit at this particular point in time. Uh, but the group that I've probably rankled the most is the 9-11 Truth, Mo- Truth Movement. Uh, in 2009, <laughs> uh who you could call the architect of the 9-11 Truth m- movement, which is a pretty bad pun because he is actually an architect. He came to New Zealand to give a series of talks, uh, one at Te Papa, which is our national museum where they rent out auditorium space, and one at a workers' union hall up here in Auckland. And... He arrived in the country to a massively sold-out, essentially, uh, 
ordered tw- oh, wait, you didn't have to pay to get in there, but sold out as in uh, no, it was only standing room in a auditorium of 500 people, which is apparently the biggest audience he's ever had for one of his talks, which I find fairly interesting. He's been more successful in New Zealand than he has been elsewhere in the world. And he, yeah, it's actually, for some reason, it really, uh, 9-11 truth, movements really resonate in New Zealand. We actually have a fairly high level of anti-American sentiment <coughs> in New Zealand. I'm not entirely sure why it's so high here compared to elsewhere in, in the West, but we actually are very suspicious of the American government, what they do, what their plans are, and I think that feeds into uh, subsequent sympathy towards the 9-11 truth movement. Uh, and he ended up actually having a meeting with the leader of one of our minor parties, uh, Jeanette Fitzsimons, and this ended up causing a bit of an outroar because Jeanette Fitzsimons had actually endorsed a book written by another truth movement leader. And a reporter for one of the major dailies here got in contact with me and said, look, are you aware that Jeanette Fitzsimons has actually endorsed the 9-11 truth movement? And I said, oh, well, I, I did read a comment by her endorsing one of the books they've written, but it did read to me at the time as if she was doing the typical politician thing, where someone had said, have you read this book? It is interesting. And her very vague response was, yes, that certainly is an interesting book. It bears investigation. And I said, so it actually does sound initially as if actually she's not actually endorsing the thesis whatsoever. She's simply being you know, a good politician by keeping a door open for a possible voter. And so Matt, the reporter, said, oh, actually, that, that sounds like a plausible gloss on the situation. I'm going to go away and actually just ring Jeanette and find out you know, what she really believes. And he rang back half an hour later and said, look, I've spoken with Nick Fitzsimons. It actually is the case that she's sympathetic towards the notion that 9-11 was an inside job. What do you think about that? Uh, Matt and I had a 20-minute talk. Uh, the eventual article he was able to write was, I think, only 800 words in length. And so it, it ended up just being a one-line quote from me uh, to the extent that I thought that Jeanette Fitzsimons was foolish to endorse the thesis compared to how much evidence there was for the rival outside job hypothesis. And this sent a stream of visitors to my blog, essentially accusing me of working for the man, uh, for not appreciating the complexities of the discussion and so forth. And so it was the beginning of my interaction with the 9-11 truth, mo- truth movement. Uh, at the time, I was actually down in Wellington because I'd flown down specially to actually go to Richard Gage's talk. I went to the talk. I sat through the three-hour presentation. I wrote a whole host of notes, which I then posted online, which basically went through and showed that there were a large number of inconsistencies with the story that Gage put forward as his rival explanation for the destruction of the Twin twin Towers. And that caused more outrage by the 9-11 Truth Movement, and I got a vague legal threat telling me that I should desist I received a rather interesting letter from an Australian man who said that he'd once had dinner with Mr. Gage and a Japanese general who agreed with Mr. Gage and how dare I besmirch their honour by uh, saying that their claims were untrue. Uh, And by this point in time, I was back in Auckland. And so I went to the second Richard Gage talk saying, look, I'm going to go to the second one uh, to get an even better (coughs) grip on what he's saying because a three-hour talk is actually really, really hard to keep your attention focused on the essential narrative that flows through it. And so I wrote a subsequent post updating the first one, pointing out all the things I'd missed the first time, and actually pointing out a whole lot of other inconsistencies in Gage's view. And that led to even more negative discussion of my character. And at no particular point did people actually engage with what I said 
what they engaged with were character attacks upon my person. So rather than saying, you're wrong for believing this, the actual explanation is this other thing over here, they would accuse me of actually working for the establishment and deliberately putting disinformation out there to basically make their particular view look as ridiculous as possible. Yeah, that's interesting. And, and, and again, um, my own uh, well, background, I suppose, to some degree, when I was at school, I got involved in debating. And I've always thought that good intellectual debating is a healthy thing. The idea that you take any point of view and form a contrary argument based in fact. And it, it, taking emotion out of the equation, the idea of good, pure debate has got to be a healthy, worthwhile activity that ultimately gets both sides, as it were, closer to the truth. But as you correctly point out, sometimes emotion um, gets into the mix and people react not to the facts or not to your questions about facts, but sometimes just go directly um, to a personal attack. And it, it's almost as if by coming forward with a contrary argument to something that somebody believes in, you are attacking them. And I, I think that the f most obvious thing that always leaps to my mind in situations like this, I'm always drawn back to, to um, Doctor Who, uh, one of my favourite TV shows, and I remember... A wonderful show. Yes, yes. Uh, back in the 80s, I remember, and I was guilty of it myself to some degree, but there's a, a, a an ownership, I always call it the fan ownership, where we had grown up with the show, we didn't like some things that were being done, the direction the producer was taking, the casting. And people, uh, fans... Um, almost um, become emotionally entwined in, in, in this case in the show and react emotionally to anything to do with the show whether it's a criticism or, a, a, or an item of praise rather than looking at the actual uh, text in isolation and this seems to be what's happening with, with you and what you found because you should be entitled I would feel to as you say go to somebody's um, presentation if you find that there are logic flaws within it, pointing them out and then have them dealt with. In an ideal world, that would be what you would want to happen. But in reality, you have found that in some cases, some people will not respond that way and will instead accuse you of being, as you say, working for the man. Uh, yeah, and I mean, the thing which really fascinates me about this is that I'm not a conspiracy sceptic. I'm of the firm belief that there are lots of warranted examples of beliefs in conspiracy theories, examples where conspiracies are responsible for the state of play in the world as we historically know it. But I'm always treated as being as someone who is slightly critical of particular conspiracy theories as someone who is out to discredit them all. And it's sort of it's disturbing to be put into a camp that I don't actually feel any identity with. Uh, it's almost being robbed of my own identity. And in the case of, no, you will play the role of the top debunker and the king skeptic here. In the case of, well, not really comfortable playing that role. That's not what my research tells me I should believe. And I'm very much driven by my research as opposed to any preconceptions I'm trying to confirm by writing a PhD. I think I find that, too, the project that we're on, the group of us that run Irish State of the Moon, and we're nearly two years into it now, sometimes uh, I find more socially than through responses we get, but we get great responses on our Facebook, and we get occasional emails, and we get you know some real good, intelligent responses in that avenue. But socially, amongst my friends, sometimes people who don't really know very much about what we do and what I do assume that it is something else entirely, and rather than assuming that we you know, take guests on and try and listen to them and try and understand and try and critically analyse politely and respectfully what they're saying, sometimes assume that we are the lead trumpeters uh, for all of the uh, uh, messages that our guests uh, bring forward. I mean, we listen to the messages, we try and understand them, but we don't necessarily uh, run out beating the drum for those things. And people sometimes misunderstand and, and assume in, in kind of the same way you've just mentioned uh, what we're doing is one thing whereas our own perception of it is something completely different and yes I mean you know, it is actually it's, it's, it's quite weird uh, I mean I can see why 
on Life Save the Moon, you're not particularly comfortable with using the term conspiracy theory because it has a largely pejorative meaning in our current culture. And so if you mention you're talking about these things <coughs> which fall under the rubric of what others call conspiracy theories, you end up being labelled as being part of the bunch of nutters as opposed to a group of people who just want to understand so why is it you believe this particular thing? Yeah, and, and, and that drives what we're doing and drives um, kind of what, what you're doing as well. Now, having looked uh, at your background, having looked at one specific example that brought you onto my radar, King Ring, and having talked about the, the, the PhD in, 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 in some respect on the radio let's come, and the, the blog, let's come back to the PhD for a moment. Having read the first chapter and thoroughly enjoyed it, it, it does make fascinating reading. Uh, you look head on at the idea of what a conspiracy theory is. You explain, for instance, it doesn't have to be a group of people in a shady room. One person. Uh, there's an argument to be made for the idea that one person having a plan and working in secret and pulling strings, that can be called. And you can go back into history. You've done that with regard to examples. And you really get up close and personal with uh, your definition of what a conspiracy theory is actually is. Yes, I mean, I, 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 to try to avoid the entire pejorative aspect of what a conspiracy theory is, I say, look, let's strip it down to the bare ba basics. When we talk about conspiracy theories, we're talking about any explanation of an event that happens to cite the existence of a conspiracy as some salient cause or feature of that event which means that we can talk about conspiracy theories as being malevolent, or we can talk about conspiracy theories as being benevolent. All we're saying is that when you explain something with reference to a conspiracy, so saying a conspiracy causes things to come into existence, that is a conspiracy theory that allows you to talk about the warranted instances of conspiracy theories through history, like the Moscow show trials in the in 1930s Russia. Uh, any explanation of the events of 9-11 basically cite the existence of a conspiracy, whether it's the executive branch of the American government or Osama bin Laden and the heads of the various groups that operate in Al-Qaeda. These are all conspiratorial actions that were undertaken to destroy the Twin Towers, and thus any of those stories will end up being a conspiracy theory as well. And if we strip conspiracy theories down to that basic level, then we can avoid having to worry about the pejorative meaning of conspiracy theory, the theories that no rightfully-minded person is supposed, uh, is supposed to believe and actually deal with what is it that actually makes some conspiracy theories good explanations of events, and what makes some conspiracy theories bad explanations, the kind of things that we do rightfully dismiss out of hand. Where is work with the PhD at the moment, and what's next for the PhD uh, with regard to uh, uh, being able to read it and the people that when it's finished, etc., etc.? Well, at the moment, I'm in the end game where I'm editing the thesis into its final shape. So in January of this year, the thesis was 102,000 words, but it was a bit overweight in some chapters. Some chapters repeated bits from er earlier ch chapters. There were some dead ends, which I thought were good research points four years ago, turned out not to be particularly useful now. So I've spent the last three and a bit months basically <coughs> pairing the early chapters back to their most basic form, rewriting large chunks of it. I've still got three chapters to rewrite at this particular stage. The plan is to have a full draft, all the chapters in the right place, English basically settled into a grammatical form that most human beings should be able to un understand. And then my supervisors will read the entire thing from woe to go rather than isolated chapters, give me feedback, and hopefully submit the thesis sometime in January or August of this year. 
at which point I will take a welcome break from academic writing. I'll probably vegetate in my room for several weeks, watching a large pile of DVDs, reading an even larger pile of books, and probably playing a few computer, computer games as well, just to keep myself physically occupied during this process. Uh, at which point there'll be an oral at some point at the end of the year uh, where all going well, it'll pass in, and then I shall become doctor dentist, and I shall take the academic world by storm, or at least try and find some kind of work uh, in the current uh, economic recession, which is not particularly good for those of us in the humanities at the moment. Mm -hmm. Departments are shrinking, not not growing. And I do have a a, a second project to work on, uh, as you mentioned earlier in our interview together, I've got a really big feeling for the history of the country that I live in and, and grew up in. And I want to look at some of the sort of odd and unusual pseudo-histories and other histories uh, which are prevalent in New Zealand culture. So there are a group of people who believe that a Celtic super civilization existed several thousand years ago, and they were the first people to colonize New Zealand. So I want to look into what arguments they have, what they base the evidence upon, uh, and how they deal with the counter evidence and the sort of the official history of New Zealand, and also to extend why people believe such things. Uh, there's a particular Maori iwi called the Moriori, uh, who lives in the Ch Chathams, which is well off the coast of New Zealand. For some reason, in the early 20th century, uh, a particular anthro uh, anthropologist by the name of Elston Best got it into his mind that the Moriori were Melanesian as opposed to Polynesian. This came as a surprise to the Moriori at the time because they knew they were a Polynesian people uh, and were basically just another iwi of the local indigenous Maori. But for some reason, Elston Best's story survived in the education texts up until the 1960s and is still actually widely believed to this day. So I'm also curious to know why that particular alternative history has actually managed to sustain itself in, despite the fact that the evidence actually points in the complete opposite direction. And so my hope is to move on from the discussion of conspiracy theories in general to looking at the alternative histories that exist in New Zealand and see what we can learn about what we take proper history to look like, how it works, and what counts as an acceptable historical explanation based upon the fact that all these other weird histories have also managed to not only survive and persist, but in some cases thrive in a particular part of our community. That is fascinating, and it's not completely different, as you correctly say. I mean, it's not a leap, complete leap from what you're doing now, because again, there is that whole avenue of why people believe something and contrary to um, facts and contrary to other people's uh, memories and recollections. Um, good luck with all that what happens to the blog what happens to the radio i mean when you uh, fast forward a few months and when all this is over will you keep making the post or will that just fade because it's no longer uh, necessary or part of your process i think what, was, what will happen once the thesis is handed in is the first thing i'll do is i'll probably end up slinging a whole lot of stuff online that just didn't make the final cut of the thesis. So you'll get, you know, alternative ends to the thesis where it turns out the butler did it after all. The butler's responsible for all the conspiracies in the world as far as I'm, I'm concerned. Uh, so you'll get into chapters, research areas that I just didn't go into at the time. Uh, then I suspect long term the blog will probably shift its attention from being mostly about my research into conspiracy theories into mostly being my research into the next project. But I certainly don't plan to stop doing the commentary and such like. I'll, I will keep that alive because I actually quite enjoy finding examples of these things, going through, looking at how the arguments work, where they stand up, where they fall over and the like. 
And the same will be true of the radio show as well. Uh, there is a market for people talking about these things in an easy-to-understand, sometimes slightly jocular, but still serious way of analyzing what's being said and why it's being said, the kind of things that are believed and why we might want to cast doubt on some of those claims, or in some cases talking about the historically verified instances of conspiracy theories in our culture. And so I think that will continue on as well. I certainly, I really enjoy doing the radio slot. It's nice to be able to get out of the house, actually talk with people about these things and actually engage in the process. You know, I get so much feedback. Uh, one of the problems of writing a PhD is apart from the occasional feedback you get from your supervisors where they say, this works or this doesn't work. It is, you know, a solitary experience. And the more you can do to actually engage with your community and talk about things, the more enjoyable it becomes. And I think that enjoyment actually translates. And that pe if people know you enjoy what you're doing, they are more inclined to listen to you and consider seriously what you've got to say. Okay, you're segueing beautifully into really the last portion, the last couple of questions I have here in front of me, because at the end of every show, we like to bring it back to the listeners and the idea that the guest, yourself, has something to offer that the listeners, in a concrete way, can act upon right away. And there's two things that leap to mind uh, f for me listening to your story. First and foremost, um, exactly what you just came back to there a minute ago, which you mentioned before. Um, turning a solitary project into a more communal and enjoyable one. And that's certainly something that I would hope listeners listening to you right now would take on board and maybe apply to something they're doing themselves. Um, it's, you know, it's, an, it's a transferable skill that people could run with. And, and certainly I've found it myself in, in a less strenuous situation, but I've certainly, sounded, I've certainly found that it's uh, worked and I think it's well worth stressing that. The other question and the other aspect that I want to bring to you, and it's the same vein, um, with regard to being in a situation um, where you are taking a contrary position, and sometimes you have to defend and you have to deal with irrational um, um, attacks upon you, as it were, or as you say, sometimes somebody going for the messenger, not the message. Uh, what, what would you say to somebody in a situation like that? How do you deal with that? How do you kind of debate with somebody who won't debate? How do you um, try and get your point across to somebody who isn't really listening to your point at all? Um, is there any advice? Have you any wisdom, anything wise and wonderful that you want to share with us about that? Well, I mean, when I first started to do, uh, when I first actually approached my department about doing this particular project, I actually encountered quite a lot of stiff resistance from philosophers. Uh, by and large, in academic circles, conspiracy theories are treated as a wacky class of belief that everyone knows are essentially bunk, and there's no merit to doing any academic research into it. We just know they're bad examples of beliefs. Now, I don't believe that. I think there are lots of warranted examples of conspiracy theories. But trying to persuade academics, that this was a worthwhile project to do was initially quite disheartening. And it's hard to know what to do in that kind of situation where the epistemic peers, the people who belong in your peer commu community, if they don't approve of what you're doing, they will express that. They'll express that either by telling you you're wrong or they'll express that by not listening to what you're saying. As you said, when you try to explain what you do with Irish side, side of the moon to your friends, people often go, oh, yeah, not quite sure how to cope with that. I'll ignore it. Or I'll say, oh, you belong to the class of nutters then. I never really thought of that of you. Uh, and, I mean, one thing you can do about that is realize that if you really do think you've got an argument for a particular position and you've thought about it and you've looked for counterexamples and asked, is my reasoning sound? Have I considered alternative explanations? And you've come to your particular conclusions and you've reasoned through them and you hold to them. There is a certain amount of strength that comes from knowing that you've got 
a reason for believing what you believe. Now, you may not be able to persuade every single person you meet that actually your position is at least principled, if not actually right. But as long as you've done the work and you've engaged in the process of auditing what it is you believe, then that can sometimes be enough to get you through sort of the darkness of having to deal with the kind of retribution or vindictive behavior that some people will actually espouse because they just don't agree with the kind of thing you're doing. And so that sometimes can just be enough to get you through those dark and lonely nights. But the other thing to note is that there will be other people out there who are, if not going to agree with you, at least be sympathetic. And so it's important to try and find those particular kinds of communities. Uh, one way to do this, uh, if you're worried about, you know, are my arguments quite good enough, try and locate an adult education course in critical thinking or argumentation theory so you can actually test your particular beliefs on someone and ask how they feel about it, you know, whether they think you've actually got an argument towards a particular proposition. The more you engage with your community, the better your thinking is going to be, and the better your thinking is going to be is going to flow back to the community as a whole. Uh, we can't operate in isolation. We've got to find a way to actually communicate with one another, and hopefully that way the truth will out. Matthew Dentith, it is a pleasure. It has been a pleasure. It is a pleasure on my side as well. Um, I hope we get talking again, um, not because of technical problems, as, as listeners won't know, but as you well know, we've had some tech issues. You were an absolute gentleman dealing with those horrendous tech issues, I have to say. I will praise you to my dying day because of that. Uh, a pleasure to have you on the show. A pleasure. Uh, I wish you uh, every success with all your projects, with this particular thesis, with everything that comes next. I hope you're in the Northern Hemisphere or at least in Dublin at some point again soon because I'd love to meet you for a pint somewhere and we can thrash out not only all of these things, but as I urge people to check out your blog and your radio appearances, I will point out that they will find references to WKRP in Cincinnati, Lex, V, sundry wonderful television programs, and that just all automatically sets off all sorts of good um, uh, light bulbs over my head when I read and hear those things. Um, it's good stuff, well worth checking out. We will have the links, uh, the link to the blog uh, on our own uh, main blog and on our Facebook, etc. And uh, again, a pleasure wishing you success and looking forward to crossing paths with you again in the near future. As am I. And that was Matthew, Matthew Dentith. A great pleasure speaking to that gentleman. Uh, to check out his uh, web presence, go to allembracingapisto.org, allembracingapisto.org, and there's an hyphen after all and a dot after embracing. And obviously, dot org begins with a dot. There we go. Uh, and you can check out, as I said, the archive, or there's links to the archive or whatever of radio, uh, his Conspiracy Corner, which airs on radio in his part of the world. Um, I think probably the Rapture one, I'm just looking at the download MP3s here. The Rapture one is probably my favourite. Um, again, it, it's it's um, they're very humorous, uh, but they're also very thought-provoking and uh, they're well worth checking out. Uh, as is the website and uh, as are the various uh, articles and comments etc there again simply looking at conspiracy theories uh, using critical thinking uh, very healthy at the end of the day um, having somebody like Matthew on the show uh, goes to the core of what we are doing here or what we are trying to do here with the Irish side of the moon um, something that's very reflective, maybe uh, more between shows as we 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 uh, we talk amongst ourselves, myself and Shane and Gabriel particularly. I've said on a few occasions uh, at our team meetings that um, I wish we that I, I would put forward the theory that we should uh, podcast some of those as well, which we did in the early days to a certain degree. 
but uh, as we discuss the guests um, bringing these guests on the show it's a real uh, privilege to speak to these people to get a first hand chance to question them about the messages that they are bringing uh, we like to find out a bit about the person we like to find out a lot about the message and we like to try and criticise it or not criticise it ourselves but try and find the alternative theories that are out there and try and see what comes out of the mix um, firmly believing myself firmly believing as part of the team we all believe uh, good healthy debate uh, can only benefit all of us as we try and figure out what uh, is is true out there what really is true and uh, as I say bringing somebody like Matthew on the show finding his his website and uh, bringing him on the show hopefully we'll get him back again uh, maybe try and entice him he's going to be very busy uh, but maybe entice him back for a few minutes here and there we'll see um, so check out all embracing uh particularly if you want to uh, think which uh, which is always a good thing that was show number 76 looking back looking forward back uh, 75 Tommy was speaking with Daniel Brinkley uh, basically 1975 during a thunderstorm it says here Daniel Brinkley was talking on the telephone when a bolt of lightning hit the phone line sending thousands of volts into his head and down through his body Brinkley was thrown across the room and later reported seeing his lifeless body spread prone and uh, basically uh, this gentleman has uh, been uh, telling uh, in, 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 if in the years since telling us all about um, what he experienced what he saw on that occasion and on another occasion and uh, his near death experience is considered to be one of the most famous uh, in, in, in the world and Tommy spoke with him on show 75 uh, very very uh, very good show I enjoyed that uh, immensely myself um, I usually hear these things just the day before they go live uh, they were that, that recorded often long before that but um, try and keep to a routine here so I, I only heard it myself uh, last week and I thoroughly enjoyed it uh, next week's show 77 think it's me again uh, I've already spoken with this gentleman Mark Jacobson uh, professor of civil and environmental engineering at Stanford University and uh, basically uh, this gentleman has put forward uh, a paper with regard to um, a, well the name here yeah a, a plan to power 100% of the planet with renewables a plan to power 100% of the planet with renewables uh, published in 2009 uh, with uh, Mark Delucci and I will be uh, speaking with Mark Jacobson on show 77 um, unless we push it back to 78 uh, Shane makes all those decisions but anyway I think that's the next one we're running with uh, in any case check out irishsideofthemoon.blogspot.com and of course you can follow us on twitter as well twitter.com irishsideofmoon because there uh, there was a limit on the number of characters so that's why we don't have um, we don't have a longer or more full uh, name I'm just clicking on it there Irish side of moon yes there wasn't room to put in anymore uh, so yeah you can follow us on Twitter um, but primarily uh, I think most people now are following us on Facebook and uh, we have over the thousand membership now I think it's time to stop keeping count at this stage it's just boring now to keep counting we've crossed the thousand we're very very humbled by that and uh, it's great to see that it's such an active group of people as well and just looking at the Facebook taking a quick look down the most recent posts uh, we see there uh, top of the list uh, Greece of course it's in the news as we record this uh, uh, with regard to its finances etc uh, story posted there and we have uh, Sarah Dahi and Carol with a K responding to that. A couple of comments underneath it then as well. Dahi and Ashley uh, sack the politicians and get out of the EU. Popular uh, couple of responses to that one as well. Moving down the list. Um, uh, uh, psychiatric disorders are not medical diseases. Uh, how psych psychiatric drugs can kill your child. And uh, YouTube clip there and a lot of responses to that Elaine, Helen, Eileen Anya, 
Tracy Karen and somebody using infinite infinitely aware as their um, nom do nom de Facebook and comments uh, 12 comments uh, going down the way I see Helen Eileen and the last one there uh, in memory Shane Clancy comment my son did not survive antidepressants um, uh, was the most recent comment there at that moment uh, Bigfoot investigators hope DNA test will confirm existence of uh, two man beasts uh, interesting that's actually something we will be dealing with on an upcoming show uh, it's already recorded I think it's probably going to be show maybe 60, 70, no, 76 probably 79 I think am I right uh, yeah, we'll be discussing, well, touching on it um, indirectly. Um, very good show. I'll tell you a bit more about that. Or somebody, Tommy, will be telling you about that, I suppose, closer to the time. Um, I, w- I did that one myself. It's very, very good. Really enjoyed it. So, yeah, a story there. Um, uh, uh, Bigfoot investigators, etc. A couple of responses to that. Marsha and uh, no- Novica. I hope I'm saying that correct. And Michaela. Uh, Michaela Shamrock. A couple of posts there. Uh, on the page and again uh, uh, throw out this invitation seeing as the platform is there and as seeing as it's now a very busy platform certainly if you have something that you feel pertains to Irish Side of the Moon's subject uh, material and would be of interest to the listener base uh, um, the Facebook is certainly a good place to 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 post it there and if you want to get in touch with us a uh, good juncture to mention that uh, Michael at the Irish side of the moon will get directly to me. Shane at the Irish side of the moon. Ie gets to Shane. Um, and again, if you want something maybe included in the show, or if you want to suggest uh, a subject or a guest, particularly a guest, we'd be more interested. Yeah, if you want to suggest a guest for the show, please uh, send it on an email. Uh, probably more more for Shane. Uh, for who, who's in charge of that side of things but yeah uh, would definitely encourage that also if you're aware of radio stations as we're being carried now by some radio stations around the world uh, if maybe a local station or you're connected with a station and you want us maybe to contact somebody or you want to initiate contact or whatever uh, probably myself Michael at the Irish side of the moon dot ie would be the best email looking back at the Facebook um, wacky BBC geoengineering climate change ideas a YouTube clip crazy radical extreme fringe scientist uh, David Patrick Sally likes that another Greek storyline there uh, cheer the sore land of the free uh, liking that Michaela Johnny Stefan uh, a couple of comments a couple of likes um, Buy a half gallon of sugar, water, or KFC. Give a dollar to diabetes research. Another story. And again, Brian, Harry, Siobhan, Tracy, Colin. Uh, great to see these people. It's, it's good to know that people are uh, interacting and getting involved. And we want more and more of that, of course. Uh, comments from people. Uh, more Greece. Greece is a favourite of ours at the moment. But, of course, it's important. And it's in the news in a very big, uh, very big way. Uh, is in the papers this morning. I was having breakfast, and uh, again, yeah, as I said, this is this is very much in the news. Um, distant voice, just checking here. Anything else? Uh, oh, there's last week. We're back a week. I see our uh, show posted there, and again, Adrian and a few others, John and uh, David, responding to that. Uh, Adrian actually yeah Adrian uh, had posted before that uh, just asking us when we were back because we had taken one of our breaks longer than usual but we always take a break between each 10 show season and uh, again Adrian thank you very much for, 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 for getting in touch to find out when we would be back the 10 most puzzling ancient artefacts 9 comments on that um, hemp story uh, IMF cyber attack boost calls for global action so there's a variety of so stories posted there uh post your own get involved uh again we want to try and build a community around this project and uh it's happening <laughs> it's actually happening well so um thank you for participating and um it's great reading all of the comments um and uh, don't forget to check out the show's archives then we have them linked and at the moment we're still using a blog 
uh, but it's fine blogspot nothing wrong with that perfect um, it gets traffic and uh, it gets downloads and uh, that's that's the, that's the important thing really from our point of view plus we have a YouTube yeah we have a YouTube channel and uh, you can check out Irish side of the Mo- Irish side of moon on YouTube as well we're now putting full shows up there switched over to a director account a couple of weeks back so the intention now pre- previous to this we had to piecemeal chop up the shows that's now uh, at the moment now the plan is just to put up full shows there as well uh, go back to our archive and stick those up so a couple of shows up there at the moment and many more to come um, so yeah we're on YouTube as well so check out that and share the links again share the message if you think it's worth it obviously I mean we're not just blanketly uh, asking you to share it check it out if it's if it's thought provoking if you agree with it if you disagree with it if you think it's worthy of discussion um, discuss it with your friends discuss it with us uh, if you think it's well if you think it's worth sharing then then share it you know it's, it's, that's what it's all about here on the other side of the bin that's certainly what we want and of course we're on iTunes as well um, we're everywhere we're just everywhere um, okay everything else that needs to be told I don't think so I think that's everything you need to know you can check out Matthew's blog I'll mention it again all embracing uh, hyphen after all dot after embracing google that phrase or just um, check out our blog where this will be archived and uh, that brings us to the end of the show if you're listening to the podcast if you've downloaded this you're listening on iTunes then this is the end of the show and you're very very uh, um, we're, we're very thankful, thankful for, you, for you for joining us you're welcome back next week if you're listening on any radio station that's carrying it uh, stay tuned because there will be some archive it'll be an excerpt from our archives to bring us to the end of the 90 minute time slot so if you're listening downloads thank you very much bye bye and on your if you're on radio somewhere stay tuned for uh, a little bit more bye bye we are irish side of the moon freedom of information personal empowerment the irish side of the moon i still have a dream this is just a ride ride change any time we want. It's only a choice. No effort, no work, no job, no savings of money. A choice right now between fear and love. Love, love, love. Freedom of information, personal empowerment, the Irish side of the moon.